Thank you all so much. As you just heard, I'm political editor of townhall.com, Guy Benson, and I must say it's such an honor to be sharing this rostrum with so many committed conservatives, brilliant thought leaders, influential politicians, and also apparently the host of Celebrity Apprentice All-Stars. When I first heard that Donald Trump had been invited back to speak this year, I honestly thought it was a hoax. Um, I immediately demanded to see the original long-form version of his invitation, uh, which he has suspiciously refused to produce. I can't help but wondering what he's hiding, um, and I think the American people deserve answers. And to that end, I've dispatched a team of investigators to New York to look into the matter. Uh, so far, all they've managed to find is a series of bankruptcy filings. But with Trump, at least we know uh, that the conservative outreach movement to minorities is going to begin with locking up the orange vote. By 2016, the Republican nominee will be able to count on the support of Trump, John Boehner, Tan Mom, and a sizable percentage of the coveted Oompa Loompa demographic. So there's a silver lining in all of this. We've got a great program for you this afternoon. Thanks for being here. Our first speaker in this session is someone you're already very familiar with. We're excited to hear from him. The Honorable Rick Santorum is a former senator from Pennsylvania and the founder of Patriot Voices. Rick served in the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate, where he has championed conservative social and economic principles. Santorum has penned bestsellers, It Takes a Family, and American Patriots Answering the Call to Freedom. Please join me in welcoming Senator Rick Santorum. kind welcome to, uh, back to CPAC. Yesterday I was in Pittsburgh where Karen and I spent some precious and painful moments with Karen's brother and his family at the bedside of their oldest son. Billy was a terrific, vibrant young man who for the past few months has been struggling against a horribly painful disease that almost overnight began ravaging his body. But yesterday, he was not the one in pain. Medicines were effectively blocking all of his physical pain. We were the ones in pain. Our family and his girlfriend were in incredible agony as he slowly and peacefully took his last breath. I couldn't help but have my experience yesterday impact my message to you today. I thought of Buddha's first noble truth, to live is to suffer. Our society has done an amazing job in reducing physical pains with medicines by dulling our senses. But that has come with an epidemic of addiction and dysfunction. And it's not just doctors who seek to eliminate pain. For 100 years, the left in government have made it their mission to have a government program to address almost every pain. As their allies in education deny truth so there is no wrong and therefore nothing to worry about. And their allies in Hollywood and the media promote a culture of titillation and violence that numbs our senses in an attempt to please us. All of this has resulted in an epidemic of psychological, moral, and spiritual pain and suffering. As the philosopher Peter Kraft says, quote, America conquered, has conquered the world of pain, but we have lost our soul, our meaning, our hope, and our purpose. Let me take you back to my nephew's bedside, because there was more going on yesterday than just suffering. Through the tears were words of encouragement 
and comfort. Our tears were full of hope that all of this suffering was not in vain, that this was not the end. I must admit that experiencing the death of my young nephew was a surreal experience. As I looked over at my suffering wife and held her hand, I began to think about Karen and I being on another floor of that very same hospital 22 years ago. I was at Karen's bedside holding her hand while she was experiencing excruciating pain. She was in labor with our daughter Elizabeth. Like other mothers, she endured that pain because the pain had reason and purpose that made it bearable. New life. Just like our pain yesterday as we ushered Billy into a new life with our Lord and Savior. Here's another truth. Here is another truth, this time from Viktor Frankl, a man who survived Auschwitz. Quote, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. The how, of course, is suffering. And Americans are suffering today, particularly lower income Americans. But how? How are they suffering? Are lower income Americans enduring more physical hardship than the same group of Americans 100 or 200 years ago? We all know the old saying, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Are Americans worse off today from the standpoint of health? No, we are not. We are living longer than ever with drugs and devices that keep us going in spite of ourselves sometimes. How about material health? Objectively speaking, thanks to technology and the dynamics of our economy, a low-income person today would have creature comforts that would exceed the wealthiest of Americans 100 years ago. Yet the suffering is greater today because our culture and our political leadership have robbed them of the why of America, our purpose. They have transformed the American dream that gave us purpose and hope and made suffering much less bearable. What is the why of America? What is the American dream? But we all know that America is not like any other country in the world. We are not an ethnicity. We're all hyphenated Americans, Irish Americans, African Americans, and Italian Americans. No, America is a why. It's an ideal. It's a set of principles and values. That's what holds us together. That's what has given us purpose throughout the centuries. And where does that come from? It comes from our founding document, the Declaration of Independence. Before that declaration, the colonies, if you had gone to Georgia or if you had gone to Massachusetts or Virginia and asked them what they were fighting for at the Revolution, they'd have given you different answers. But our declaration brought us together and gave and breathed into America its soul. And of course, you know these words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. God is mentioned four times in the Declaration of Independence. We are the only country in the history of the world. We are the only country in the history of the world that has based its premise upon rights given to each and every one of us from God, not from a sovereign, a king, a legislature, a court. We are different. 
And as a result of that, we have strived and accomplished great things. We have suffered through that. But because of this great purpose, we have been able to endure and prosper and hand, as every generation has, hand America off a little better than what we were. That is the why of America. America, in its essence, is a moral enterprise. A moral enterprise focused on the dignity of every human person. If all we do this weekend is offer Americans a better way to get more stuff in hopes that, they, that this will dull their pain, we and America will lose. Face it, the left can always promise more stuff and make it sound like they care more because they make it easier for Americans by providing the stuff for them through government programs paid for by somebody else's money. For those in our movement who want to abandon our country's moral underpinnings so we can win, permit me to paraphrase a great teacher and ask, what does it profit a movement to gain the country and lose its own soul. The left in America and around the world has made that Faustian bargain. For the sake of our country and our movement, we must not. President Obama says he wants to transform America. Leave it to President Obama to see himself in such a grandiose role in the world. But let's be honest, America has been in the process of transforming for 100 years. He just wants to close the deal. He has successfully offered a new deal to the American public. He and his friends in Washington will reduce the pain and the suffering They'll reduce Frankel's how. In exchange, we simply have to abandon the why of America. He wants to exchange the why of the American Revolution for the why of the French Revolution. The Marquis de Lafayette, after the American Revolution, as the French Revolution was underway, left this country with a picture frame. And the picture frame had two places in it, one for a document, each, each for a document. The first side of the picture frame housed the Declaration of Independence. The second was empty. He had hoped to go back to France and place in that picture frame a document similar to America's a document that also established a great moral enterprise, a great why that would encourage people to bear much, to fight for those high-minded principles and leave something great for the future. When he died, that place was still empty. Why? Because the French Revolution, although it sounded like ours, the French Revolution was based on equality and liberty. Sounds like us. But the final word of the French Revolution was fraternity, not paternity. Rights did not come from the father. Rights came from each other. They replaced the sovereign king with a sovereign mob who could lord power over the people, which led to the guillotine and to Bonaparte. What we see in modern-day Europe is simply a descendant of that bargain. A godless, a society that is godless without faith, 
specifically anti-clerical, anti-God, where the government is the center, and they are the ones who care for us. This, this is President Obama's New Deal. Give them more power. Give them more authority, and they will take care of you. How do we turn this around? How do we make a difference in America today? I've tried to do my part. I was started... Karen and I started an organization called Patriot Voices to speak for those principles, not just in Washington, but across this country. We have a movie that's showing this afternoon called Our Sacred Honor that in detail explains, I worked with Citizens United to in detail explain this tension that exists in America today and understand our role in it. How do we win? Well, how did we win the American Revolution? Did we win because we had bigger guns? Do we have nicer uniforms, better generals, more discipline and order? No, because we wanted it more, because we had the passion on our side. We had the set of conviction because we were fighting for something good and noble. Let's face it, folks, the passion in America has been on the other side. They live their lives every day to transform us, and we who think everything is going to be just fine. America isn't really going to change much. We just go about our lives. It's not to say we don't live good lives. We do. Most Americans live very good lives. But we don't have the passion that they do to, in every aspect in our lives, rise up and fight against what our founders said was the greatest threat to freedom. Time. Time. The erosion. The erosion of our values over time. That we will lose that revolutionary fervor, that passion for truth. And so it is happening. I'm out here today as I have been across this country because Karen and I are committed that we are not going to let that happen on our watch. I would say to all of you, don't look to Washington, D.C. to solve this problem. I served 16 years in the Congress, and I can tell you, there are very few leaders in Congress. There are a lot of followers. They stay very, very close to where the American public is. Congress and the President are simply a reflection of what America is today. So if you look to them to solve your problems, let me assure you, you will be disappointed. The answer is here. G.K. Chesterton wrote at the turn of the last century to a British tabloid that asked him to publish an article entitled, What's Wrong with the World? Chesterton agreed to write such an article. A few days later, he submitted it to the tabloid, and they published this. What's wrong with the world? I am respectfully submitted G.K. Chesterton. We are the answer because, in part, we are the problem. We, who have so much, have to rededicate ourselves in our churches, in our families, in our communities, in our school boards, in our local nonprofit organizations. In every aspect of our lives, we have to fight for the principles that made this country great. We have to fight for those who are suffering and being left behind. They don't want government money. They want your money. Not because they want your cash. They want what comes, and they need what comes with it. 
your caring, your mentorship, your love, all things government cannot give. We call the generation that survived World War II the greatest generation. Why? Because they were more virtuous than you? They were more courageous than you? No. No, they weren't. They, too, tried to avoid getting into the war, tried to avoid the suffering. Remember, it was a year and a half after France fell to the United States got in, and only after we had a bomb drop on Pearl Harbor. We watched France fall. We watched Britain get bombed and leveled. And we did nothing. The greatest generation. We, too, have watched the bombing, the destruction, in hopes that somehow things will just work out. That's what the greatest generation did. But here's the difference. The greatest generation became great because when their country needed them, they met the challenge of their age. Today, I ask you, Join me at Patriot Voices. Join me in preserving the American dream, in fighting for your dream. Text me. Text the word dream, plus your dream, and how you want and plan to make that dream happen, to preserve America at 67463. You do that. You commit yourself. to being the next great generation. And we, we will be the ones who not only saved America, but preserved that last great hope for the world. Thank you, and God bless you. Don't stop, girl, you know.